Good morning. Welcome to another CSI Summer Science on the Screen program. Next week will actually be our last virtual program, but we'll be right here at 10 a.m. again next Wednesday um, to talk about shipwrecks. Don't forget for this program that our chat box is open um, and we'll be answering questions throughout. So if you have any questions, especially for Parker, um, make sure you type those in and we'll answer them live. Great. Thanks, Dave. Today we are going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to focus on the natural beauty of coastal ecosystems and how they can inspire art. Dance, along with other art forms, can use experiences, observations, and objects as inspiration. And today we're going to focus on those that come from nature. Before we get started, Dave is going to give us a recap on what we've learned in the last four episodes as that may come in handy later today. So let's remember that we're on a barrier island right here on the Outer Banks. And so we have estuary side, um, which is brackish water, and we have an ocean side, which is the Atlantic Ocean, which is salt water. Um, and in both of those environments, we have waves. We usually have larger waves on the ocean side than the estuary side, but we do have waves on the estuary side as well. Um, and that we use those waves for different reasons, or for, we use them in different ways. And so that was our first program we did was all about waves. And so we have waves that we use for recreation, but scientifically, we're also interested in studying waves and to try to figure out ways that we can use the energy in waves to create electricity. Um, and that's something we talked about as well. Now, in those different environments, um, there's all different types of animals. There's marine mammals, there's fish, um, there's invertebrates, and they all look different and use different adaptations to thrive in those environments. Um, and so we want to keep that in mind as we look at some different pictures today of different things. We want to kind of think about why we're seeing the shapes that we're seeing and what that might mean. Yep, so whether it's how they're built or how they're colored or the way that they operate, each of the things that make up these diverse environments can be broken out down into patterns, shapes, and lines. In a minute, we'll take a look at various nature photos that we've picked out to help us understand. But first, I'll share with you some of the basic ideas of dance and how to make a diverse choreography or string of movements. So with dance and choreography, the, um, they can have many components. If a piece is done with many dancers, the maker may choose to have them all dance the same thing at the same time. And if you're thinking about 30 dancers up on stage all together, doing the exact same movements at the exact same angles, that's a pretty impressive thing to see. Um, while the choreographer could decide to have all of the dancers um, come together in a union, they can also use different forms of variation that would help make the piece a little bit more diverse. So, for example, each dancer could have mostly the same step sequence except for one step and that might be different for each dancer. Another way that they could add variety um, to the dance is that the dancers would dance in what they call a canon. So one dancer would start and then we'll say three steps in, the, another dancer would start the same sequence over and over again. So that would be like Dave and I singing Row, Row, Row Your Boat with me starting first and him starting the same song three words in but we'll save ourselves from some of that embarrassment and we'll save your ears as well. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later as we go into some of the uh, photographs. Another way that a choreographer could add diversity to their piece is by having some dancers start tall while some starting lower to the ground. That adds different height variations. Along that line, you could also use a different variation of depth. So maybe some dancers are at the front of the stage, some are towards the back. And then you could use that, some are towards the right, some are towards the left as well. And then finally, one of the last things that helps to make a dance is the repetition, whether that's of an idea or a theme or whether it's the same steps or a sequence of steps over and over again or even different dancers repeating those steps at different times. So the other day I got outside and was able to look around what was 
um, in the environment around me and was able to create a couple uh, sequence of movements for you guys to see. So we'll look at those next and I'll talk about some of the things that I was looking at and trying to incorporate into my body movements. So for this first sequence, I was at Sandy Run Park in Kitty Hawk. Um, there, looking in front of me, I could see um, a pond and also to the back as well. So for these first set of movements, I was actually using my hand to trace along the uh, shoreline of that pond. And then I was thinking about the different turtles that I would see and as they pop their heads up and down, how they make ripples through the water. Right about now, one of the things that I heard was an osprey flying up above. So I kind of wanted to take in that sound and think about how they were soaring through the air. And then also how some of their movements can be so direct when they're hunting and trying to find their prey. For this one, I'm down on the sound side in Nags Head. And one of the things that really spoke to me about this area was the way that the oaks kind of intertwined and also moved with the wind. So some of these movements are very um, smooth and transition one into the next while the individual parts of my body are kind of all interacting together to make this larger piece. Another thing that I thought about was how the sound can look different at different times of the day or with different types of wind. Sometimes it's really choppy and rough and other times when the wind isn't very uh, blowing very hard, it's rather smooth. And so finally, I was able to find a pretty green space. And this one specifically made me think about how plants grow. So it starts out very small and eventually slowly rises toward the sun and they begin to spread out. One of the other things that I was thinking about is how they stay large for a long period of time. And besides that, how each individual plant may grow, but a lot of them repeat the same life cycles depending on the species. So those are just a couple of examples of the ways that you can incorporate natural inspiration into dance. And now we'll look at photos to show you some other ideas. And later on, you guys will get to create a piece of your own. Yeah. So starting with this first photo, this is one that I actually took in Ireland a few years ago. And while I was standing out on the cliff side, one of the things that really caught my attention was that the way that the waves just came in, one after another after another. And you could really see them build from all the way out here. And one of the things that's really neat is how each one, I noticed, is pretty equally spaced apart. So it was this pattern of swell building. And not only that, but also just the straight, but very smooth lines. And then a lot like that, we have a breaking wave right here. Um, and we can see how all the molecules interact with each other. Um, and so each molecule is interacting with another molecule. And like that last picture we just saw, the energy in the water is interacting with the shoreline and also with anything that's in the shoreline. So there was rocks on that. Um, last picture and, and the energy from the wave would interact with those rocks and that would change how it's moving. Um, so the way that the water's moving and the way that the molecules are moving is related to what else is happening around it. That's right. And in addition to that, this picture kind of reminds me of what we were talking about earlier with cannon. So if you look at how a wave crashes, it generally starts to crash at one point and then it begins to move down the line. So each set of those molecules is kind of doing a similar thing, but they move along. So for this next photo, what really caught my attention at first is the way that everything kind of swirls together and interacts. But when I read more about the picture, I learned that it was actually a plankton bloom that gave it that um, greenish color, and it, they were actually floating along with the current. If you guys remember from our um, estuaries episode a few weeks back, plankton are, don't really have the ability to swim against the current, so they are considered drifters. And then looking at the shoreline, the Argentina shoreline that's right there, um, think about how Parker was trying to use her hands and her motions to do the shoreline that she was visually seeing, but how would you move your body in such a way to interpret that Argentinian shoreline? 
That's a good point. One of the things we thought about next was plankton on an individual level. So remember, Dave talked about their migration patterns, and so that could be inspiration of height or depth within your piece on stage. But another thing that we can look at is the individual shape of plankton. So up here you'll see you have a plankton that has more of an oval shape, where and one over here that's a really large circle. I also see more of a square in this plankton. But then down here we start to get one that I don't think that I could really assign a specific shape to. One thing that I do notice though is how the, uh, the profile of the plankton generally flows one thing into the next. Whereas the plankton over here, you have this sharp line at the top and sharp edges down into the next part of it. So those are all things that you could think about when um, you're trying to place movement on your body. Are your joints bent at very soft angles or are they bent at harder angles and, angles, and that can make a big difference in the way that your piece is interpreted as a whole. So this picture of the shoreline, this is our shoreline, this is off Cape Hatteras. It's an older picture, um, but look at the shape of it right at the point. And then um, that's the lighthouse that's in that picture has actually been moved since this picture was taken. So our shorelines are constantly changing because of the energy of the waves. So that the wave energy comes up on the shoreline. You probably have all seen a breaking wave before. That energy is released onto the shore and it can change the way that the shoreline is shaped. Um, so it's a whole process that takes place right where the water meets the land. And so this particular shoreline has had a lot of change um, because of storms and erosion. And so this is just an older picture that kind of tells us a bit of a story over what's happened over time because they've had to move that whole lighthouse, which was quite a feat, um, in order to keep it standing so that it didn't disappear into the ocean. That kind of reminds me um, of how dance can sometimes be created as a process. So the dance that I made the other day and the dance that you guys will make later on is more of a short-term thing. But if you think about choreographers that are making these world-renowned pieces, they don't make a piece in a few seconds. They are constantly reshaping and revising their work until it's what they want to present. So it's kind of like the shoreline reshaping as over time. So the next photo we have is one of kelp. I liked this one because you could kind of see how the current is taking it through. You can see a general pat or line of the kelp as it flows and the plant as a whole, but then you can also look at each individual frond and see how it's flowing. And so some of those pieces look different and have different shapes than the plant as a whole, but you still get the general direction. And so I like to think about that in terms of the individual, individual parts of the kelp working together to create this whole larger piece. And along those lines too, the kelp is part of a larger picture that it creates because it's a habitat for lots of other things. So those kelp fronds have things that live on them that don't live anywhere else and they interact with the kelp in such a way that it benefits to live in that environment. So we talked a lot about environments and plankton and marine mammals and things like that. This is a different environment that's usually on the west coast, um, but the same thing, the way that that kelp moves, it provides space and habitat for other things to live in it. Cool. What do you think those animals would look like that lived in that environment? I think they would look a lot like that kelp. Probably there so. There might be some in that picture. We'll have to take a look later, <laughs> see if we can find any. Maybe y'all can play a game of I Spy at home <laughs> as well. So our next picture is a satellite image of a hurricane. So one of the th there's a couple things to think about here. First, you very clearly have a circle at the eye of the storm. But besides the circle, you also have the rest of the storm that looks like it spirals out from the center. Beyond that, it's really cool to think about the hurricane as a system and the hurricane at the individual level, too. So it's spinning around itself, but while it's doing that, it's also moving up the coast. And then speed is something else we could think about when we're talking about making interpretation of this, right? The hurricane while the storm itself might move pretty slowly, the winds within the storm are moving very quickly. And so the changes that it's making on our shorelines can happen at a much faster rate 
than when we were just looking at a slower waves breaking across the shore over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. This can be very drastic and dramatic um, when compared to other things. That's right, and that brings up a good point. Another way that you could add variation into your choreography is by having the dancers do the same sets of movements, but some could be doing it at a slower pace than others. Or if you're choreographing for yourself, you might have some movements that move really slow and then jet off into something else. So next we have a picture from Jockey's Ridge. One of the first things that really stood out to me in this photo is the way that the light is right from the center and then it begins to radiate and dissipate into the sky. So for that, I would think about broad movements that maybe start from the center of your body and begin to reach out. You could also think of that in terms of the way that you use the space that you're dancing in. Maybe it starts in a very confined space, but gradually begins to grow until you're using the entire space. Another couple of things about this photo that I really like is I, they seem to be three different um, things going on. So you have the sound in the background, then you have this line of trees right here near the edge, and then finally you have the sand dune, all of which gives this photo, if you were actually able to see it in real life, a lot of diversity of different heights and textures and things like that. One other thing, though not natural, that you might notice from this picture is all of the footprints. Perhaps while you're visiting Jockey's Ridge, you might notice that footprints take a particular path. And that might be something, that path might be something that you could incorporate into your movement across your um, dance space. Well, so this one um, has got some very interesting texture. And so looking at this picture, you can see there's things in different dimensional space, like Parker was just talking about. There's things that are taller, things that are closer down, but there's also a kind of a repeating pattern that's found throughout. And so this close-up of coral um, has different colors, different textures, and also different patterns within the picture. That's right. So on this level, I see that each of these lines build on top of each other. And they're very specific, but then if you were to look at it as a whole, you'd probably begin to see this meandering pattern right here and how that um, takes up the entire space and just winds through to create all of these intricate designs. And so we talked a lot about fish in one of our other programs. Um, and so the way that fish school, the motion that's there, um, if you ever get surrounded by fish and kind of a ball of fish, you can really see how they move all together. Um, and so, like Parker was saying, sometimes in dance, dancers are going to move in relation to each other all as a big group, um, or they might move separately. The school knows how it's moving. Do you remember how? How does the school fish know how the other fish are moving? The lateral line. There you go, the lateral line. So the lateral line of the fish allows it to feel the other fish in the water, and they can all move together. Do dancers have that ability? Not the same ability in that they can feel each other, but dancers actually use peripheral vision a lot to be able to make sure that they're in their right space in relation to another dancer and to make sure that they're also moving at very specific increments. So next we have a manatee. Um, looking at this picture, I see um, things that at first glance you would think are in opposition of each other. Looking at the animal itself, the manatee, I see big, clunky, doesn't really know what to do with its body. But if you think about how a manatee and other marine mammals swim, it's actually very graceful. So the manatee is using its paddle-like tail to propel itself through the water. If you need help trying to envision this, think about how a dolphin swims or how you would imagine that a mermaid would swim. So these things can actually, the big clunkiness and the graceful swimming can actually give you two different um, oppositions to create variety for your piece and shows that they actually can work together. And then while we're sticking with large animals, right, one of the largest fish in the sea, um, the whale shark, nice slow movements, not a very fast moving shark. Um, eats plankton, so it doesn't really have to chase things down to catch it. But the motions that it bodies makes, that big S that it can do, um, is very graceful. 
And so thinking about how something so large can move um, gives it a, a lot of grace and a lot of very specific movements. Sure. So here's another photo that I see very specific angles in this photo, but when you think about the bird as a whole again, you might also begin to see some opposition that could work together. So when the bird, this green heron, is perched on this tree, you can see it's got very sharp angles. So its toe leads right into its leg. Its joint is very bent at a um, hard angle. And also you'll notice that it has a large, straight, pointed beak. And I get a lot of um, like hardness from this picture. And you would think about um, movements that might be jagged or very straight to the point. But when you think about how a bird flies, that actually is a very smooth movement through the sky generally. And then finally, for one of the last pictures we have, it shows you just how different shapes can be found even within the same object. So for our shell over here, you generally, when you look at this picture, would see a triangle. But then if you begin to break it down, you would notice that it is built and it looks like it has these lines that it stack on top of each other. But I bet if you were to look at it from the top down, these lines would actually be a spiral and that overall you would see a circle as the outer profile there. The same thing can kind of be said for the sand dollar. You have this larger round shape, but inside you have lots of smaller ovals. And then I even see when you get to the center, maybe a star. Yeah, so that, that five parts, you can see those five parts, that's called pentaradial symmetry. And so echinoderms have that kind of symmetry where there's five equal parts. That kind of reminds me, you can use symmetry um, for dance as well. So if you had two dancers on stage that were mirroring each other, you could have them doing the same thing, but one going to the left and one going to the right. And so it would look like a mirror and that would be your symmetry with the two dancers. You could also do that with your own body with both the left side of your body and the right side of your body doing the same thing. And finally for this clamshell, just one last takeaway. Again, you have the triangle general shape, but then if you look at it, you then start to see that, oh, it has rounded edges, which are much more smooth than you would think of having with a um, triangle. So now we're going to lead you guys into an activity. Um, all of these different things that we've looked at through the photos that we've discussed already show a lot of different components that you are able to pick and choose um, based on your artistic choices, what you want to do for your dance. Um, one thing that's really cool about all of these choices is that they're actually found in nature. And um, so now we'll talk or we'll show you this vid activity. So what I'm going to get, this is an activity that can be found online. Um, you guys can head outside after this video and pick a scene or an object and I'm going to have you guys draw it. But the catch is, is you can't move your pencil off of your paper. You can't pick it up. And you're also not going to be looking at the paper when you draw it. You're only going to be looking at your object or your scene. So I've had Dave pick out one of the pictures that we already talked about earlier. And I'm going to look at the computer screen over here and draw that. And you guys will get to see what I'm drawing. So Parker's going to draw a heron. All right. A bird. We'll see how this goes. One thing when you guys are drawing that you can think about is if you want to include just your bird or your object, or if you want to try and include things in the background too. That could actually help you to add more variety later on. So right now, I can confirm that Parker is not looking at her sheet. She's only looking at the screen and drawing without looking at her picture. Yeah, so that is the picture that you guys saw, the green heron. That's uh, my interpretation of it without looking. So I'm going to point out a couple of things next for you guys, and you will start to look at your picture in the same way. 
Um, I'm going to only pick out two, but I hope that you guys will challenge yourselves to pick out maybe four or five different things that you notice about your photo. That's where drawing the background of the photo could also come in handy to give you more to look at. So the first thing I see is this very pointed line right here. It's definitely a lot straighter than most of the rest of the picture. I see angles right there too. But what else I see are these very smooth wave-like lines. So those are two things that I'm going to think about when I would make my dance. So for example, for the pointed line, I might think about having my arms be in very specific directions, very straight. My elbows aren't bent very much. Another thing that I could think about is incorporating that into my movement. So maybe I start at one point of the stage and make a very direct movement to the other point of my space. Then you could also think about how you then see waviness. So perhaps while my arms are very straight, my head is just slowly moving. And that creates some of that smoothness. Another way that you could also incorporate that is by having your joints more um, bent and smoother. So instead of having it like this, you might do something softer or wave your arm back and forth like that. There's a lot of different things that you could do. Finally, one thing that I'll talk to you guys about is what kind of space that your drawing takes up within the box that you're provided. So I look at this drawing and I see that it really takes up one corner. So if I was going to do this dance by myself, maybe I'd just try to stick to that part of my space. But what if you had other dancers? Do you, do you think that there's ways that you could kind of think about that, Dave? Well, especially since we're using a bird, could you have other dancers doing different parts of its life, like when it's flying? You yeah. Know, looking like that. Sure, and maybe I'd put them in this space outside of that so it would represent a different part than what we're seeing right in our drawing. So that should get you guys through the activity. Um, like I said, I encourage you to make, pick out four or five different things from your drawing, um, find positions or movements that represent that, and then string those movements together with other transitions. Um, if you guys are still curious after that, I encourage you to look into the process of, um, like for example, the bird, what its life stage is, or if you were using plankton, how it migrates, or how they develop, and maybe that can even add increased inspiration to your piece. Great. There's also a, another activity online um, that has to do with using real data to create a picture. Um, so you could do that one after you've done all your dancing. All right. And we appreciate Parker and all of her hard work with dance and her expertise. Um, thanks for tuning in, and we hope that we can see you next week for our last program, which will be on shipwrecks. Sweet. See you guys next week.